Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the IPS Northern Lecture Series by Professor Joseph Liao, our 13th SR Northern Fellow for the Study of Singapore. Today, Professor Liao will be delivering his first lecture titled On the Age of a Precipice, Paradigms and Prognosis for the US-China Rivalry. Following his lecture, Professor Liao will take, uh, Liao will take questions from the audience in the Q&A session. The Q&A session will be chaired by Associate Professor Simon Tay, Chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. Before we, get, before we begin, please allow me to go over some housekeeping rules for the event. Thank you for joining us at the auditorium today. Please be reminded to switch your mobile phone off to silent mode. The lecture is being streamed live on Facebook. It will also be recorded and uploaded onto our IPS website and our social media platforms later. Please submit your comments and questions at any time during the lecture through the Facebook comment box. For our audience members here at the auditorium today, please step up to the mics during the Q&A session to ask your questions. We will try to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A session. We would also like to hear your views on the event. There will be a link in the feed at the end of the lecture, which you can click onto it to submit your feedback. Or you can look at the QR code, uh, you can scan the QR code uh, to submit your feedback. Deputy Director of IPS, Christopher Key, will now deliver his opening remarks. Chris, please. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 13th IPS Northern Lecture Series. Our 13th SR Northern Fellow is Professor Joseph Liao Chen Yong, Dean, College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at the Nanyang Technological University, where he is also Tan Ka Ki Chair in Comparative and International Politics. Professor Liao's lecture series is titled Navigating Uncertainty, a region in an age of flux. In his first lecture today, titled On the Edge of a Precipice, Paradigms and Prognosis for the US-China Rivalry, Prof Liao will delve into the deteriorating relationship between the US and China, exploring the reasons for their deepening strategic competition, the potential for reconciliation, and the implications of this rivalry for Singapore's interests. This will be followed by a second lecture on the 1st of November titled Southeast Asia in a Shifting Global Order, Grasping the Nettle or Groping in the Dark. Prof Liao will examine Southeast Asia's transformative journey from a once tumultuous region to one of rapid economic growth. The emerging challenges posed by geopolitical shifts and the Myanmar crisis, and how nations, particularly Singapore, can navigate these complex dynamics in the face of evolving global orders. Finally, in his third lecture on 27th of November, Prof Liao will discuss Southeast Asia's balance of pluralism and polarization, examining how domestic politics can magnify internal divides and divert focus from foreign policy and strategic goals. I'd like to thank Associate Professor Simon Tay, Chairman, Singapore Institute of International Affairs, for moderating today's Q&A. Prof Tay is renowned for his insights on international affairs with his critically acclaimed work Asia Alone and specialty in international law. He is a fitting choice to moderate today's Q&A. We at IPS are deeply appreciative of his presence this evening. Yes, our Northern Fellowship, for the study of Singapore was established in 2014 to pay tribute to our sixth and longest serving president, the late Mr. S. R. Nathan. The fellowship aims to promote greater discourse on Singapore's public policy and current affairs. Held on campus as we are today, the IPS Nathan lectures seek to advance public understanding and stimulate discussion on national issues to engage the minds of Singaporeans and in particular students. With generous support from our donors, IPS managed to raise around $5.9 million, including a matching grant from the government to endow this fellowship. We would like to thank individuals as well as corporations, including those who give to IPS annually as part of the Corporate Associates Program for their support and generosity in funding this fellowship and supporting IPS. To end off, I'd wish to extend our collective appreciation to Prof Liao for accepting the role of our 13th fellow. We believe that 
we, or I believe we echo the sentiments of all present when we convey our eager anticipation for the knowledge he will impart in this lecture series. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Liao to begin his first lecture. Professor Liao, please. Distinguished guests, friends, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I must admit, when uh, Janadas called me a few months ago and said that I was going to be uh, appointed the IPS SR Nathan Fellow, my immediate response to him was, I think you got the wrong number. Uh, Mr. Nathan was my first boss when he hired me at in December 1996 at the then Institute of Defence and Strategic Studies. He was, uh, to me, a wonderfully nurturing boss who took a keen interest in my development and always made himself available whenever I needed advice, even when he was serving as President of Singapore. I am particularly delighted today that uh, Monisha, Mr. Nathan's uh, granddaughter, is here for today's lecture. It is indeed a great honour and privilege to be named the 13th IPS SR Nathan Fellow. 13 will be my favourite number from now on. <laughs> IPS told me that they hope my lectures can help frame ongoing thinking and discussions on global affairs, on how current and future events may affect Singapore. As our leaders have repeatedly reminded us, navigating the great power competition between the US and China is the foremost foreign policy challenge of our time and will be so for the foreseeable future. For this reason, I have chosen the topic of US-China relations for my first lecture. Now, some previous SR Nathan Fellows have already touched on various aspects of this topic. Two of them, Bilhari Kausikan and Chan Heng Chi, devoted entire lectures to the topic. Both, by the way, are far more authoritative on the subject than I am. Uh, but too bad you are stuck with me today. Now, the bilateral relationship between the two largest economies in the world is not in a good place and has not been for some years now. Structural and strategic competition has intensified across an entire spectrum of issues from trade to technology, defence to diplomacy, infrastructure to investments, supply chains to sports. A series of high-level meetings in recent months may offer a glimmer of hope that the relationship could be turning a corner. But the reality is that sound principles and mechanisms to manage differences and competition remain elusive. If anything, the situation remains brittle, and further deterioration can be easily triggered by another balloon incident, another round of tariffs and sanctions, an incident at sea or air, or a visit involving Taiwan. For us in Southeast Asia, the proverbial question of choice hangs like the sword of Democles over our region. Rather than provide a blow-by-blow -blow recap of US-China relations, what I propose to do this afternoon is to take a step back and look at the paradigms that help us understand how the relationship arrived at this point, where things might be headed, and what Singapore can and should do in response. On 13 January 2009, former National Security Advisor in the Carter Administration, Zbigniew Brzezinski, delivered a speech in Beijing on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the normalization of relations between the US and China. In his speech, Brzezinski proposed that the US and China should work together to tackle a laundry list of problems afflicting the world. His proposal quickly morphed into the idea of a G2, which Brzezinski would go on to elaborate in a Financial Times article. In response, 
then Chinese Foreign Minister Qian Chen, who was also at that conference, spoke emphatically of, quote, in the past of how in the past three decades, thanks to our joint efforts, the ship of China-US relations has moved forward, braving winds and waves, unquote. When it was mooted, this idea of a US-China condominium handling global affairs was received with a healthy dose of skepticism in many quarters and no small measure of discomfort. The question was not so much whether the two powers could actually pull it off, although that was certainly a valid concern, but whether an international structure that by design would probably diminish the voices of other states, as the idea of a G2 implied, was acceptable. At any rate, those were, in retrospect, halcyon days in US-China relations. It was a time when US national security strategy documents took great pains to highlight and showcase cooperation with China. During the Bush 43 administration, it was the issue of counterterrorism. During the Obama administration, it was climate change. On both issues, China was described as a strategic partner. Fast forward to the present, we know that the G2 failed to materialize in any substantive way beyond perhaps the Paris Agreement of 2015 or incipient cooperation on denuclearization of the, Konin, of, of the Korean Peninsula, both of which, by the way, have been overtaken by events. If anything, it was profoundly ironic when we consider where relations have ended up today. Indeed, Tian's meteorological metaphor of US-China relations braving winds and waves was turned on its head at the 20th Party Congress last year when President Xi Jinping called on China to prepare for, quote, strong winds, high waves, and dangerous storms, unquote. Talk of a G2 has given way to more ominous diagnoses that a new Cold War has descended upon us, or that the US and China are locked in a Thucydides trap and quite possibly destined for war. Although to be fair to Graham Allison, author of that book by the same title, he did not in fact claim that both the US and China are destined for war. He only argued that the odds of war are high. What set off this tailspin? And what lies ahead for this most important and consequential bilateral relationship? To say that relations between the US and China have deteriorated spectacularly over the last few years is to state the obvious. The level of distrust between the two powers has reached a point where each cannot but view the other with deep suspicion, and every gesture is scrutinized in a manner that is becoming alarmingly zero-sum. Now, there are a number of perspectives or paradigms that shed light on the situation and that have been used either implicitly or explicitly by those who closely monitor and study this relationship to better understand the dynamics at play. Let me discuss five of them. The first is what is known in the field of international relations as power transition theory. I will spend a bit more time on this paradigm because it is probably the most popular in terms of efforts to explain what is going on in US-China relations today. It certainly has much traction among strategic thinkers in both capitals, but particularly in Beijing. Basically, this theory proposes that when an ascendant state rises to the point of equivalence of power to the dominant state in the international system and is dissatisfied with the status quo, the likelihood of war is very high because the rising power will want to challenge and displace the incumbent and the incumbent will not want to cede dominance. The classic case of irresistible force meeting immovable object. It is clear in today's context who is the ascendant power and who is the incumbent power. The rise of China over the last few decades out of the throes of poverty and societal mayhem, I'm referring to the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, of course, has been one of the great stories of human history. And it is on the back of this rise that advocates of power transition theory suggest China is approaching the point of equivalence with the US, the dominant state. As one data point, 
China's GDP was barely 4% of the US's when the decision was made at the third plenum of the 11th Central Committee in 1978 to open up the Chinese economy. Today, that percentage is approximately 70% and possibly rising. Likewise, they will also argue that China is a dissatisfied, uh, oh, sorry, China is dissatisfied with the current US-led and US-dominated global order and is seeking a redistribution of power through a number of China-centric initiatives such as the BRI, the SEO and BRICS. So does China really want to displace the US? According to our late founding Prime Minister and Minister Mentor, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, the answer is pretty obvious. In an interview conducted by American political scientists Graham Allison and Robert Blackwell in 2013, Mr. Lee was asked whether Chinese leaders are serious about displacing the United States as the number one power in Asia and the world. Let me read out his response. Of course, why not? They have transformed the poor society by an economic miracle to become now the second largest economy in the world, on track, as Goldman Sachs has predicted, to become the world's largest economy. They have followed the American lead in putting people in space and shooting down satellites with missiles. Theirs is a culture 4,000 years old with 1.3 billion people, with a huge and very talented pool to draw from. How could they not aspire to be number one in Asia and in time, the world. Mr. Lee's answer begs an obvious follow-up question to my mind. Can China eventually replace the US? As I mentioned earlier, there is no denying the phenomenal success that China has achieved since Deng Xiaoping turned the page of Chinese history. China's influence today, particularly its economic influence, is quite simply an indisputable fact of contemporary geopolitical and geoeconomic life. Nevertheless, I think we should also bear two important points in mind. First, regardless of the drumbeat of pride and patriotism, many Chinese public intellectuals are of the view that their country has not yet arrived. In fact, it is precisely from this vantage of China in a state of becoming, as opposed to a state of being, that Beijing interprets US actions as pulling out all the stops to frustrate and block its rise. Second, I think it would be naive to assume the Chinese economic growth story will continue uninterrupted into the future. There is a school of thought that suggests the remarkable rise of contemporary China is a long and inexorable march towards realization of the China dream. They remind us that China is not simply a nation state in the modern sense, but a civilizational state. And not simply any civilizational state, it is a 5,000 year old uninterrupted civilization of which the CCP and Xi Jinping today are but heirs. In my view, such a teleological reading of affairs that casts history as destiny runs the risk of interpreting the complex unfolding of events in ways that are too simplistic and path-dependent. It abstracts history from the human experience, sanitizes it of uncertainty and unpredictability, and drains it of meaning when, in fact, historical trajectories are full of blips, detours, twists, and U-turns. China may be a 5,000-year-old civilization, and a rightly proud one at that. But lest we forget, this history has also been defined by cycles of tranquility and upheaval. China today is undergoing a period of economic duress. Will the Chinese economy recover? I believe that it will, but not overnight and not without some tough course corrections. In the meantime, the world will not stand still. And in the context of US-China competition, all indicators suggest that America certainly has not been standing still. There is no doubt that American society is itself plagued by a raft of problems and challenges, some of which are very grim and alarming. But it is still quite a leap to extrapolate from this that the US is in terminal and irreversible decline. 
I know the Chinese certainly no longer believe that, if they ever truly did in the first place. I mentioned Graham Allison earlier. He would go on to put his own spin on power transition theory when he popularized the term Thucydides trap. In his book, Destined for War, Allison examined 16 occasions when a rising power came up against an established hegemonic power and found that in 12 of them, the outcome was war. We don't have time to delve into the details of each of the cases, but in brief, what do the data points from his study tell us? First, while the prospect of, for hegemonic war between two great powers is high, it is not inevitable. The fact that there are four instances where a power transition occurred without resulting in war, three in the 20th century alone, two involving nuclear armed powers, is itself interesting as the proverbial dog that didn't bark and, well, gives hope for us all. Second, in the event of war, it is not necessarily the case that it is started by the rising power. Often, it may not even be either power that starts it, but smaller states that are their allies. The foremost example of this, of course, is the First World War. Third, a change in the distribution of power on its own may not give rise to conflict. What determines the prospect of war between great powers is often not merely raw power per se, but what the emerging state and the hegemon decide to do with the power at their disposal and how they go about exercising it. What this means is that other factors necessarily come into play. This includes the presence of nuclear weapons, for example, which can dissuade great powers in possession of them from fighting directly with each other, albeit at the expense of an increased chance of proxy wars. This describes the tone between the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War and is what we call the stability-instability paradox. My main point is that structural factors are necessary but on their own insufficient conditions for great power war. Otherwise, there really is no need for further discussion. The US and China are bound for a great power war that will undoubtedly be catastrophic so we all had better go home and reinforce our HDB-approved bomb shelters. A second paradigm is what is called the security dilemma. The concept of the security dilemma posits that measures taken by a state to increase its own security tends to heighten the sense of insecurity in other states, leading them to take their own measures to feel more secure, which in turn heightens the insecurities of the first state. This action-reaction dynamic is perhaps most vivid in Europe today. NATO membership is explained as a means through which small states that border Russia seek security. But the expansion of NATO through the inclusion of these members, however, is viewed as a threat by Russia, which then takes, as it were, preemptive actions that increase the insecurity of these smaller European states. Needless to say, the dynamic also plays out in the Asia-Pacific, where China's assertiveness has made smaller regional states feel less secure, resulting in their efforts to strengthen ties with the US. This has in turn made China feel less secure, as Beijing accuses the US of trying to contain it. We also see something of this dynamic in the Taiwan Straits. The problem there is that each side, by which I mean the US, and China, interprets the actions of the other as changing the status quo, while they view their own actions as maintaining or returning things to the status quo. But the reality is that the actions of one invariably renders the other less secure, thereby precipitating a reaction. Often, a security dilemma is rooted in misperception. States are unclear of what the intentions of others are. They proceed to take what they believe to be necessary defensive measures in mitigation, but these very measures precipitate misperceptions in others. This is where communication, statecraft, diplomacy, and careful calibration of policies come into play. 
to reduce misperception by fostering understanding and building trust without necessarily appeasing an adversary or leaving oneself excessively exposed. To quote Stephen Walt, the renowned Harvard professor uh, of international relations, the logic of the security dilemma suggests that states should work over time to explain, explain, and once again explain their real concerns and why they are acting as they are. Most people and governments tend to think their actions are easier for others to understand than they really are. And they are not very good at explaining their conduct in language that the other side is likely to appreciate, understand, and believe. Now, power transition arguments are concerned chiefly with uh, material factors, by which I mean the distribution of military and economic strength. But non-material factors, such as identity and ideology, also determine the behavior of countries. I would like to propose that identity and ideology serves as a third paradigm to understand the tense, rela tense situation between the US and China. More specifically, I want to talk about nationalism which is an amalgamation of the identity of a state and the ideology that underpins it. Indeed, one need only look at the ongoing Ukraine war for a reminder of how nationalism remains one of the most potent and powerful forces shaping the world today. A common thread across American, Chinese, Russian, Indian, Turkic, Iranian nationalism, or indeed nationalism of any other great power, past or present, is that they all demonstrate a healthy sense of their own exceptionalism and destiny. Great power exceptionalism is predicated on faith in their own unique virtues, belief in their innate benevolence, and conviction that their actions advance a greater good, as opposed to those of other powers that are destabilizing, opportunistic, or just plain predatory. Yet ironically, it is in this sense that there is really nothing exceptional about great power exceptionalism. All great powers think of themselves in the same way, and all great powers will deal with other powers on those terms. An ideological undercurrent of this nature is baked into US foreign policy. It has found expression in tropes such as manifest destiny, American exceptionalism, city on a hill, and democracy expansion, which, by the way, originated not with the neocons at the turn of the 21st century, but with an influential Harvard historian, Frederick Jackson Turner, who at the turn of the 20th century coined the term to explain the continental expansion of the United States. Even the pursuit of American primacy and unipolarity can and has been cast in ideological terms. Consider how the 2002 US national security strategy argued that liberal democracy and capitalism were, quote, the single sustainable model for national success, unquote. 20 years later, its 2022 iteration argued, and I quote, the idea that we should compete with major autocratic powers to shape the international order enjoys broad support that is bipartisan at home and deepening abroad. Democracy is always a work in progress, but that will not stop us from defending our values and continuing to pursue our national security interests in the world. The quality of our democracy at home affects the strength and credibility of our leadership abroad." Unquote. Quite interesting, I think, considering what happened in Congress last week. China has its own hyper-nationalistic narrative of exceptionalism, which casts the CCP as heirs of 5,000 years of unbroken civilizational history. China, under Xi Jinping, is trying to restore the ideological foundation of the country by expanding the Leninist system of party rule and control against the backdrop set not so much by Marxism, per se, as important as it still is as a trope, but by the grand ideas of struggle, fento, and national rejuvenation, Min Fu Sing, following a century of humiliation. 
This potent combination of Marxist-Leninism and Chinese nationalism has dominated national discourse since fundamental changes were made to national education in the immediate aftermath of Tiananmen in 1989. Even so, since assuming power, Xi Jinping has slowly but surely doubled down on ideological indoctrination of the Chinese population through Xi Jinping thought that has been incorporated into the party constitution, thereby elevating him to the peak of the pantheon of party leaders. And today, interactions between the two great powers have taken on a decidedly ideological flavour as well, with President Biden casting US-China rivalry as democracy versus autocracy. And then there is domestic politics. It is often said that all politics is local. By this token, American and Chinese posturing can be said to be driven as much by domestic political interests as they are by anything else. That American society is deeply polarized along political lines today is obvious to all. The building of consensus across partisan lines is becoming an increasingly difficult task, rendered more onerous by the absence of strong leaders on both sides of the aisle who are prepared to compromise and work together. There is, however, one exception, China policy, where both parties are in lockstep on the need to take a hard line. Yet at the same time, both are also tripping over each other to demonstrate how hawkish they can be while criticizing the other party for being weak on China. We can expect this to ramp up as presidential elections loom. As for China, domestic politics cast a long shadow too in their dealings with the US. Two observations are worth making in this regard. First, from China's perspective, the fact that America persistently calls them out over Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, and most provocative of all in Beijing's view, Taiwan, ipso facto projects US-China rivalry onto Chinese domestic politics, or vice versa. Second, the downturn in US-China relations feeds into a very nationalistic narrative that cast the United States as being dead set on preventing the Chinese dream from becoming reality. China's immediate priority is not strategic competition with the US. That is an outcome and a consequence of the manner in which it has pursued its two priorities, preservation of CCP rule and economic growth. These two priorities are intertwined and competition with the US in fact, Chinese foreign policy in its entirety is viewed through these lenses. Finally, something needs to be said about the role of certain individual leaders. The tide of history is sometimes shaped by the actions and interventions of great men and women who themselves become causal agents of epoch-defining events. Come of the hour, come of the men or woman, as they say. With regard to US-China relations, a cursory look at history will show that individuals have at various junctures played pivotal roles setting the tone for relations. Can we talk about rapprochement without mentioning the role of Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, or Zhou Wenlai? Would China have taken a different path if Deng Xiaoping did not prevail against Hua Guofeng and steer the Chinese ship away from the cliffs of self-destruction to the stable waters of economic growth and prosperity, in the process also leaving behind his imprimatur on Chinese foreign policy of Tao Kuang Yang Hui. Uh, hide your time, uh, bite your strength. Sorry, hide your strength, bite your time. <laughs> much in the same vein, we have also to ask how much of a role did Donald Trump the iconoclastic former president of the US, or Xi Jinping, the most titled leader in the history of modern China, play in escalating strategic competition. Speaking of President Xi's role in shaping or reshaping China, it is interesting to consider the extent to which China under Xi Jinping today 
is behaving very differently from the China under Teng, Jiang Zemin, and Hu Jintao. We often speak matter-of-factly about how the US has changed in recent years, how its society and politics has become more polarized in the face of culture wars. But China is also going through a period of quite considerable change, where some of the foreign and domestic policies adopted by the CE government, not to mention the manner through which he has centralized power and tightened ideological control, are nothing short of a fundamental departure from the days of his predecessors. And I do not believe it is an exaggeration to say that driving that change is Xi's own sense of mission and purpose. As a princeling, Xi considers himself the legitimate heir of the CCP mandate of heaven established by Mao, and Xi would probably also say uh, his father, Xi Songxin, as well. And as an ideologue, he seems very convinced that he knows what is best for his party and his country. In his mind, the party had atrophied under his predecessors, who allowed corrosive corruption to become endemic, and he sees it as his calling to step up to revitalize the party and the country, and to usher in a new golden era. Therein lies the foundation of that singular focus that has driven him to reshape China today as a strong and decisive leader steer steering the ship in challenging times. Having outlined five paradigms that inform ongoing discussions and debates about how and why US-China relations have deteriorated, it is tempting to try to identify one that best explains the situation. But I do not intend to do that for the simple reason that the real-world reality of this bilateral relationship in all its complexities is far more complicated than any single paradigm can capture. Indeed, at any given time, the reality will likely encompass aspects of any or all five paradigms. There should be no question that the US and China are locked in intense strategic competition. The great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation may be the collective aspiration of its people, but its pursuit is finding expression as a major challenge to American global leadership, if not dominance, which the US is not about to surrender. The question is whether this state of affairs is going to result in war. While the risks are undoubtedly there and will grow if the rivalry is left unchecked, conflict is not inevitable and the two powers are not destined for war. Beyond the systemic dynamics of power transitions and understanding of the sources of perception and misperception, the place of ideology and nationalism, the nature of each country's domestic politics and the role that leadership plays are all integral factors that will also determine the direction of this most important bilateral relationship and the outcome of its present state of competition. In this regard, I believe the role of statecraft and diplomacy assumes even greater importance to foster better awareness and sensitivity of how actions are perceived by the other side. This won't be a panacea, but it does create the necessary conditions to build processes and mechanisms to manage competition, rivalry, and conflict. So where does this leave Singapore? As a small country caught up in the waves of great power rivalry, what are our options? I believe that while Singapore would much prefer not to be placed in a position where it has to choose sides, it would indeed, and it would indeed be wise to avoid being entangled uh, in US-China rivalry. The harsh reality is that unless the geopolitical climate changes, we will increasingly find ourselves squeezed. And when we do, we will have to be clear about where Singapore stands and how we intend to manage these pressures that assail us. So how do we prepare for, these, for this growing pressure? Let me make five points. First, both the US and China are important to Singapore, 
And so we have to maintain good relations with both and avoid casting or thinking of US-China competition in binary terms. In fact, we should turn the issue on its head. In the spirit of the motto that Mr. S. R. Nathan bequeathed to the Institute of Defence and Strategic Studies, ponder the improbable, perhaps what we should also be asking is how do we make them choose us? The answer to this lies in our value proposition to them. As a small country whose relevance to the international community is not at all self-evident, and that is heavily dependent on economic linkages with the rest of the world, not least the major economies of the US and China, it behooves us to make ourselves relevant to their strategic, economic, and commercial interests so that neither would want to make us choose. How do we do that? This leads me to my second point. In order to figure out our value proposition for them, we really need to understand them better to understand what makes them tick. American and Chinese societies, politics, and decision-making have undergone profound changes in recent years. Since the end of the Second World War, the US has been the architect and chief proponent, if not defender, of the prevailing international order. But both its interest and energy to continue playing this role is waning. Once an ardent advocate of economic liberalism and free markets, the US has now embarked on industrial policy on a, well, industrial scale. Today, all the talk in the Biden administration is about onshoring, friendshoring, de-risking, small yards with high and high fences, and the foreign policy for the middle class. As for China, for reasons I had alluded to earlier, the impulse to emphasize the continuity of its civilizational instincts distracts from the reality that China today looks very different compared to the one that so captivated the world when it hosted the Olympics in 2008. And by better understanding them, I mean more than just how policies are made in Washington DC or Beijing, but also why they take the form that they do. What are the drivers of their economies, the constraints of their respective political systems, or the domestic political forces that shape them, and how the American and Chinese leaderships understand the domestic and international context upon which they exercise their immense influence. It is in the nature of being a big power that they won't expend too much effort to learn about small countries, but as a small country, we cannot afford that luxury. We have no choice but to invest time, energy, and resources to better understand the big powers around us, their interests, their strategic cultures, their societies. All the more so, given the growing complexity in their bilateral relationship and the speed at which change is taking place. Uh, if, if it's not obvious, this is a pitch for more research funding for those of us who work in these areas. <laughs> Third, we need to understand that even if great powers might genuinely not want to foist a choice on small states, make no mistake, they pay close attention to the choices made. And right or wrong, they will draw conclusions from them. And these conclusions will shape perceptions and policies which we will have to deal with. In recent years, I often found myself being asked by some American friends, as well as friends from regional countries that are allies of the US, why Singapore was gravitating towards China. At the same time, Chinese friends would ask me why Singapore is so emphatic in our support of a US presence in the region. At first glance, this presents a curious conundrum because it might well suggest that Singapore is doing something right in terms of maintaining uh, equidistance uh, from the rival powers. But more importantly, that we are working to improve our relationships with both of them, which obviously is the right thing to do. But it also tells me that both the US and China are paying close attention to where, when, 
and how we are positioning ourselves in the midst of their strategic competition. In fact, I would argue therein lies something of an irony and certainly a challenge for us today. It is precisely because Singapore has developed a strong international reputation for punching above our weight that how we manage our relations with the US and China in this present climate of growing geopolitical rivalry is a matter of great interest to many, not least to the US and China themselves. Fourth, we can and should, of course, boldly proclaim that we will not choose sides, but will only choose our national interests. No doubt, that is the right thing to do. But as they say, the devil is in the detail. What are our national interests as they relate to foreign policy towards these two great powers? For a long time, this seems straightforward enough for Singaporeans. During our early days of post-independence, foreign policy interests were clearly articulated by our founding prime minister and those involved in foreign affairs of the day and accepted by the vast majority of the population, mostly without question. The situation, I think, has become more complex today. <clears throat> Take Singapore's position on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, for example. <clears throat> the government has spared no effort in making its position very clear and has gone to great lengths to explain it. Yet I know there are still a considerable number of Singaporeans who are not entirely convinced and who persist in, if not insist on, viewing our position on the, the Russia-Ukraine war through US-China lenses, even though our opposition to the invasion has nothing to do with our relationship with Washington or Beijing. Another example, is how some citizens understand and process narratives emanating from some external powers that are designed to appeal to diasporic communities. Herein lies a curious but disconcerting twist that is manifested in two ways. First, it speaks to the sophisticated way in which some external powers may voice choice without so obviously saying or doing so through, for example, the narratives they propagate. And second, it poses the disturbing question of whether it is external powers that are forcing us to choose sides, as it were, or segments of our own population. Now, I'm not advocating that foreign policy be dictated by public opinion. It should be a result of careful and calibrated strategic thinking. But it does require our leaders and policymakers to explain, educate, explain, educate, and then explain some more why our foreign policy imperatives and priorities are what they are. There can be no letting up on this effort because it can no longer be assumed that the logic behind what our national interests are as they relate to foreign policy is self-evident. Finally, Rather than obsess over choice, we should be forward-leaning and proactive to stay ahead of the geopolitical curve. And as a small state, we probably need to be louder and to jostle harder than others in the course of doing so. This is what exercising agency is about. Singapore has always been a proactive member of the international community. This is evident in the number of initiatives and minilaterals that we have seeded and led, such as the Global Governance Group, the P4, which set the stage uh, for the TPP, uh, DIPA, the Forum of Small States, among others, a whole list. Singapore co-chaired the Friends of the COVAX facility together with Switzerland when it was uh, 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 desperately needed, and is currently chair of the UN Working Group looking into ICT, cybersecurity, and digital cooperation. We must continue to play a pathfinder role in the new domains of tomorrow's economy and security environment. Whether we are talking about the digital and green economy, 
marine and ocean conservation, disinformation, or how to translate uh, maritime domain awareness into actual uh, cooperation and policy. A forward-leaning diplomatic posture must also involve reinforcing old partnerships and seeking out new ones with other regional powers and with neighbours in ASEAN, who themselves are trying to avoid becoming entangled in US-China rivalry. This creates maximum room for autonomy and manoeuvre, which is vital for small states. Indeed, as powerful as the US and China are, they are not the only two countries that count. So I started this afternoon by looking at the paradigms that help us understand how US-China relations arrived at their current state. There should be no question that the US and China are locked in intense strategic competition that grows sharper by the day. Whether Chinese leaders say so or not, the country's rise is viewed as a challenge to US global dominance. And whether American leaders say so or not, the US is not about to surrender that dominance, not least to a power whose methods of governing its people and organizing its economy they fundamentally oppose. Whether there will eventually be a power transition remains to be seen. China has closed the economic gap with the US considerably and is working on closing the gap in defense capabilities and diplomatic influence. But the Chinese economy is experiencing some serious headwinds at present, and it will have to deal with the longer-term challenges of demographics, the middle income trap, and how to rebalance the economy from its export-driven nature to a more consumption-driven one. The US, too, faces considerable challenges. President Biden is keen to restore US leadership on the global stage, but he has to do this against a domestic backdrop of deepening polarization, the ever-present risks of gridlock, and growing debt. But what is more worrying is whether war would be an outcome of these ongoing structural jostling and adjustments. As I've tried to suggest in the lecture, while the present climate is certainly disconcerting, war is not inevitable. Practically all American and Chinese think tankers, scholars, and decision makers I know of would openly acknowledge that war is undesirable and that if it broke out between the two great powers, the stakes would be unimaginably high and there will be no winners. At the risk of simplifying very complex dynamics then, perhaps the definitive questions for the great powers themselves at the end of the day are really these. For the US, is it prepared to accept that China is a global power and to accommodate it? And for China, is it prepared to acknowledge the US is and will remain a major player with deep, legitimate and abiding interests in the Asia-Pacific region and to accept it. In that respect, I believe both are likely prepared to coexist. But at this point, the problem seems to be that both want to do it on terms that are advantageous to them. What this means is that much remains to be done in order to mitigate against further deterioration. If both powers are locked in an action-reaction security dilemma triggered by misperceptions, then dialogue and communication assume a greater degree of importance to manage mistrust and reduce the risk of miscalculation. In the face of the temptations of nationalistic brinkmanship and posturing, clear-eyed and rational assessments of benefits and risks must prevail among decision makers. And as the historical record has shown, we cannot dismiss the role that leaders play in either catalyzing conflict or reducing tensions through statecraft and diplomacy. All this is to say that while bilateral relations between the two great powers are not in a good place at present, further deterioration can be tempered and competition managed if both parties are prepared to turn away from zero-sum calculations. What about Singapore? As a small country, this is the geopolitical reality that confronts us. But it is not new, 
nor does it mean we have been presented a fait accompli or that we are consigned to our fate as price takers. As I have tried to show, there are measures we can and should take to maximise our agency and autonomy. And by way of a final observation, let me say this. If you think about it, it is not easy to find many countries that have the scope and depth of relations with both the US and China at the same time that Singapore has. So in that sense, we are in a somewhat unique position. And because of this, while we must certainly be clear-eyed and realistic about what we, can, what we think we can do vis-à-vis -vis the two great powers, I also believe we can do more than we think. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for the lecture, Professor Liao. For those watching the lecture on Facebook, please submit your comments and questions to the Facebook comment box. For our audience members here, please step up to the mic to ask your questions. May I now invite Associate Professor Simon Tay, Chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs, to start the Q&A session. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Well, thank you, Joseph, for a very good survey, a very up-to-date, broad, and also deep uh, survey of what's happening in a very important relationship. I think all of us acknowledge this as the most important bilateral relationship in the world today. After that, you then went into more precisely what you think, uh, how that relates to Singapore. You pointed out that Singapore is in a quite unique position, deep relations with both, and you tried to go beyond this idea of simply not choosing sides and what we can do more proactively. Um, I'm well aware that there are many questions that could arise, uh, and we're looking forward to your interventions. May I suggest, though, that where it relates to either ASEAN or to more multilateral and geopolitical issues, these be left because they will come up in your subsequent lectures. So I think today it makes sense to focus on uh, China, America, and their relationship. And then, of course, uh, what Singapore could do. I mean, these are the main points I certainly will be taking away from a very good survey by Joseph. Um, if I may ask the first question, I will ask you basically a more theoretical question. You have been in a think tank. That's where you started off with Mr. Nathan, a later president. Uh, and you're, you're very practical-minded, but you're also quite theoretical, especially today when you set up these five paradigms. I mean, I ask you in the sense, between these two worlds of practical and theory, praxis, how much do you feel these paradigms really help people sort of predict or prescribe how to approach the big problems, as opposed to how much they simply describe sort of after the fact what happens? <laughs> Trick question. Um, in my view, uh, well, I've, I've always felt that people, um, whether they, they consciously or, or uh, you know, unconsciously, subconsciously do it, do think in, in theoretical ways because they bring certain assumptions, right? We all do that you know, when, we, when we're dealing with a particular issue. So as it relates to US-China relations, I think what, what uh, some of these uh, theories or, or theoretical frameworks do is they, they serve as uh, uh, guideposts, right? If, if these conditions then, you know, be careful, this might happen, that might happen, right? And if it's, it's properly done research, uh, empirically validated, there is evidence to, to substantiate that kind of a dynamic, right? So, so in that sense, I think the sort of theoretical work that we academics do is not necessarily ivory tower per se. It does very much speak to the dynamics, uh, the, the sort of real world dynamics that, that we, are, we are trying to, um, to, to grapple with. Um, but at the same time, uh, of course, it's very important to also have your feet on the ground, which um, I suppose as a, from, the, from the think tank perspective, it is uh, very much about um, sort of interacting and getting yourself up to speed about how others are thinking. Because uh, one, thing, one thing I've, I've uh, realised um, 
in my experience in all sorts of uh, conferences, dialogues, discussions, and you certainly see it, unfortunately, in US-China relations. Very often, people talk past each other mm. uh, rather than to each other. Yeah. Um, okay. But they will never admit it. So the kind of implicit uh, assumptions that people have in their heads, mm. even they don't give the label of a theory or paradigm. Good. I am a professor. I certainly agree with you, and I would certainly give you more research money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, the more Thank practical you. question, if I, I see Danny Kwa is going to jump in, and there are many experts and other people interested in this topic. Let me just ask you one question yeah. relating to uh, America and China and this tension of, of, of potential war. You mentioned how experts you talk to, neither side wants it. And they both think the price would be very high. And that's very reassuring in a way. But if the leaders of, of America and China were to come to you, would you be able to prescribe more clearly and suggest how would they keep the peace between them, say, 10 years? What dangers to avoid, what topics, how to handle some of the issues? You had a very general statement at the end towards uh, how America must uh, accommodate China's interests. But what, could you scope that a bit more? Would that mean, yes, we recognize that Taiwan will come back to you, or what? What is the, the rubber hitting the road on these issues? Well, um, I think the, the, the main issue is uh, to, to what extent uh, the, the leaders or the, the decision makers of both parties, how much they are prepared to mm. give, how much latitude they are prepared to give. I think what we see today is uh, everyone sort of doubling down, everyone is digging in, the room for the room for manoeuvre, the room for negotiation has really been constricted. Yeah. And uh, I think that is, that is very unfortunate. I think that um, there are opportunities, for example, when uh, um, hopefully leaders will decide to meet later mm -hmm. this year and um, they, will, they will lend their, their, their uh, imprimatur, they will empower um, various uh, sort of uh, downlines mm. on both yes. sides you know, to seriously explore where are the areas that yes. um, there can be some uh, compromise yeah, yeah, in terms, so for yeah. example, in terms of, of uh, economic uh, uh, policy, mm. the kind of um, um, whether or not the United States is going to pursue, uh, shall we call it a uh, scorch earth mm. kind of uh, uh, sanctions, mm. tariffs and sanctions. I don't think they're doing that. I think they realize that they cannot do that. Yes. Then um, on that basis, there is a possibility to discuss yes. you know, in greater detail what are the trigger points. You know, and hopefully the Chinese will yeah. be prepared to reciprocate as well. Yeah, I think you're giving these ideas an interesting time because you talked about how it went from the balloon, you said that very early on, to where we are today when some sort of regular dialogue has restarted at the uh, secretaries or ministers level. Good. I think I've got more questions. I could go on a long time, but <laughs> to be fair to the audience here, let me take some questions or comments. Uh, also online, some questions are ap ap appearing already about Singapore. Uh, if I could suggest we'll take some questions more about China and America first and come to the Singapore questions later. But there is a young lady there. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. My name is Big Chen, a postdoc fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, so, um, you know, the South China Sea disputes is often portrayed by global media as an issue of China-US competition. So I think that denies um, the, the, you know, Southeast Asian claimants if, if they, they don't have agency. So how would you propose for the great powers to recognize the agency of smaller claimants? Thank you. Okay, that's an ASEAN question. Yeah. Yes. But never mind, it's okay, I'll, 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 I'll share some thoughts on that. I think um, you, you asked how great powers um, can recognize the agency of the small states, um, which is an important question. I think even before that, we have to ask um, the small states themselves, you know, are they prepared to address this issue in a unified fashion? Hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, we have to ask that question first. Um, if we cannot, uh, obviously the we here is, is ASEAN, right? The 10 uh, countries in ASEAN. If we cannot do that, then we basically expose ourselves 
to uh, great powers who, you know, however altruistic they may be, will always look for opportunities mm. to constrain. advance their own interests. And therefore constrain our agency. Exactly. And, and by virtue of that, constrain our agency. Yeah. So I think the yes. first question to ask is uh, the countries themselves. Uh, and uh, I have some thoughts on that. Uh, 20, know, first or 27th of November. ASEAN, <laughs> come back again. Uh, <laughs> as I said, without dictating things too much, let's try to keep it on uh, Sino-American relations. So then the future lectures will have their own room and Joseph will share his thoughts there. Now, there is a queue, so, and there's 25 minutes left. So I'll go to the man in the red shirt, and okay. then our dean, uh, in a way, the boss of this whole place, Danny Kwa, is also waiting in line. <laughs> okay. So he's very good. I mean, he's not jumping at the queue, but I do want to give him time. Then at the back there. So the gentleman in red first, then Danny, then we'll go okay. far back. I'm a fan of uh, Kiso. <laughs> Please give us your name. Okay, Kishore Lim Sui Kang. My name is Lim Sui Kang. I yes, work please. on policies. Okay, let us close our eyes. You imagine if America, okay. without Microsoft and Intel, with Plaza Accord, can he be so strong for so many years? America is strong because they have invented key technologies. It's not by beating others. So all this containment of China is useless. The main key is how to develop America again. Is that your question for Mr. Dr. It, it is both a question okay. and a comment. Thank you. The next thing is, be assured, China is hearing from you because he invited Kishore to give comment on South China Sea. Because when you have a valuable opinion, China will observe would take you in and listen to you. So the most important thing is what we can do for China and what we can do for America. For America, the key thing is how to develop. Thank you. How I... to keep America number one. Thank you very much. Can Thank I you. take a question? Joseph, would you like to take several questions at one point or uh, would you like to go this one first? Yeah, we can do a few. Okay. Yeah, maybe Good. we take Danny's question. We'll take Danny. So. Danny, he just talked about American uh, industrial policy. What's your question or comment? <laughs> okay, thank you, Simon Joseph. Uh, my name is Danny Kwa. I'm dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, Joseph, wonderful lecture. My question to you is whether you think economics enters the fray in Singapore and how Singapore engages with US-China rivalry. And there are in particular three quick things from your talk that I picked out that I thought might help us think about, about this, this issue. First is, when you turn to how Singapore can actually be proactive in the conversation, Singapore's great strength is its economic development, is how it's managed to become an economic force. Um, and if there are things that we in Singapore can teach or can help guide the rest of the world, it is in ideas about economic management. So I wonder if economic management ought to be more of a, a narrative in how third nations like Singapore can enter the conversation between US and China. A second thing in your talk, if I may, Simon, is that when you introduce Lee Kuan Yew's quote about overtaking China overtaking the United States, Lee Kuan Yew's quote is only about economics. He says nothing about civilizational, national, personality, security issues. It was entirely focused on whether China's GDP would have a trajectory that overtakes the United States. So arguably, he didn't even address Graham Ellison's question. He simply stated a fact about the economy. And then third, in your own telling, um, you know, the economic challenges that both the United States and China now face are severe. And they enter the way in which each views the other. China views America as seeking to contain its economic progress. America views China as having stolen its jobs, hollowed out American industry, cheated on, uh, on trade and other industrial engagement. So I wonder if thinking about all these economic things from Singapore's perspective, whether economics ought to be a sixth factor beyond power transition, nationalism, security, uh, personalities, and uh, the fifth thing that you mentioned. 
Thank you very much. Just may I suggest that you take yeah. the first okay. man and Danny's three questions. Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, to, to the first question um, about, of course, uh, strengthening the US and strengthening China is primarily for the US and China to do, right? It's not for us. We strengthen ourselves. Yeah. Um, but having said that, um, you, I, I agree with you that um, the US, um, the, the, to, to some degree, the obsession, although I sense it's toned down a bit uh, of late, but uh, for a time, the obsession was China. Right? and basically um, trying to do their best to um, um, uh, enact, enact policies that essentially had the effect of slowing the Chinese economy, uh, slowing China down. Right? Um, that's one way to deal with competition, I suppose. Um, uh, you know, so to speak, tripping your, 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 comp your competitor. Yeah, but of course, the, the other thing you can do is to run faster. Right, um, and so the question of uh, productivity, the question of uh, investments in infra in their own infrastructure <laughs> in in the U.S. Uh, these have all come up, and I think um, the the Biden administration has realized that. I mean, one one aspect of industrial policy is precisely that, right? To to try to enhance the productivity of the American economy and, and workforce in the way that uh, they think that they can. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, so it's a matter of uh, striking that balance. Um, Danny, to your, your, your three questions, um, all of which, uh, three very good questions, all of which uh, revolving around um, uh, economics and whether it enters the fray. You know, I, I mean, I think you know the answer to that. It obviously enters the fray, but how do we put it in, right? How do we interject it into, into the, the discussion? Um, you mentioned about um, economic uh, management. My own view is, uh, and I, I mentioned it in, in the lecture, um, Singapore's interest uh, in this regard lies in finding where we can have that value at for the US and uh, for China. Um, because, um, you know, we, we, it's probably not a good idea to start on the premise that we are, by definition, relevant to, to them. You know, it's very risky to start on such a premise. Yeah? So we have to find our, our relevance. So, so with the United States, for example, um, Singapore has, for decades, invested heavily on the one resource that we have, which is our people in terms of education, right? So um, if I just uh, anecdotally, um, from my own experience uh, in a university, the extent of uh, cutting edge R&D that we do with American partners um, to the point that American institutions want to partner with us because they know that we are at the forefront of research in all these areas, right? And we have an ecosystem that ensures that we remain in this forefront, right? NRF and, and that sort of stuff. I think that is quite uh, critical, number one. Uh, and the Chinese as well. Uh, it's not just uh, the US, it's China as well. Uh, number two, in terms of uh, training, uh, behind you is uh, uh, Tuan uh, uh, Zaino there, um, who is involved in the Nanyang Center for Public Administration. You know that um, uh, I mean, from the from the mid '90s, you know, we had been involved quite heavily in uh, uh, providing uh, training for uh, Chinese officials uh, with regards to uh, public policy, public administration. Your school is starting to do that uh, as well. Um, so, uh, so all this speaks to this issue of finding that area where we can uh, bring value to the table. Um, for uh, the US uh, and, and China. Um, on Mr. Lee's quote, it is heavily about economics, I agree. He did mention about missile shooting satellites though. So that's, uh, <laughs> you know, that's a, a little bit uh, a feel from uh, you know, uh, macroeconomics. Yeah. Um, but yes, I think you're, you're very right that he was thinking in terms of, of economic terms. I mean, we all were right in that period. It, uh, 2013, and we all saw that dramatic uh, 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 rise and progress that China has made. But um, you, I think in, in the entire history of uh, humanity, you don't have a purely economic superpower who is a sort of military, sort of lightweight, mm. right? Invariably, um, mm. yeah, 
you know, it, it, it follows. Uh, China will strengthen itself because it has to protect its economic interests. It has to defend its economic interests. So um, while he didn't state that explicitly, I think uh, yes. that logic uh, is, is, is quite clear. Um, and the, 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 the third, uh, yeah, about uh, e economics being a, a sixth uh, factor, yeah, I think we can think in terms of that. Although um, when, when we talk about power transition, yes. I mean, economics features actually very heavily there. Uh, in fact, um, the people who focus on that, the first indicator that they, the first data point, I mean, in, even in my lecture, the first yeah. data point is, uh, is economics. Yeah? Um, when we think about China um, and the rise of China over the last uh, three years, you know, your immediate knee-jerk reaction is its economic rise. Yeah. Yeah? So, so uh, it's very much uh, and The current uh, question is its economic weakness, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Correct. Now, let me go, as I promised, to the back there, then back here. <laughs> And then I have to go online, otherwise the online community feels cut off. Please. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Simon. Thanks, Prof. Liao. Thanks for the lecture. My name is Marcus, and I've got the two sharp questions for you. The first question is, um, how has the conflict in the Gaza Strip changed America's assessment of the power balance in the European theatre with Ukraine or in the East Asian theatre uh, in the first island chain? That's my first question. Second question that I have is, if an onshore intervention on all three theatres were needed, which do you think America will pick first? Okay, shall we the, take several questions? Or you want to yeah. go for this Sorry, the, the three theatres being Indo-Pacific, Middle East and... Ta Taiwan, Ukraine. Middle East and Europe. Ukraine. Yeah. Okay. Shall we take more or shall we... Uh, we yeah, maybe one, one more question. Over here. Hi, my name is Su Ling. I'm from the Straits Times, the opinion editor. Uh, my question is related. So um, with regard to Hamas's attack on Israel, how do you see this affecting US-China rivalry, especially because we've seen how um, the US has withdrawn from Afghanistan in recent years. It's focused on the Indo-Pacific and it's also committed to Ukraine. And yet, on the other hand, we've seen the Middle East as a key place for active Chinese diplomacy, especially in brokering the Iran-Saudi deal, as well as in encouraging Iran to join the BRICS. That's my first question. My second question is one on economics. Um, as uh, Prof. Simon T rightly mentioned, the recent narrative on China's rise has shifted, especially in Washington and the Western think tanks, to one of China's decline, um, centered on youth unemployment, a sluggish economy, consumption, and weaknesses in the property market. I wanted to ask, because you said that you were more sanguine about China's prospects, do you therefore disagree with this narrative of China's decline, and what makes you optimistic? Thank you. Thank you. Shall we stop there and take okay. a question? Yeah. Um, okay, so, so on the first question, which mm. is also uh, yes. your first question on uh, what has happened recently uh, in, in the Middle East, um, a number of things. First is I think in hindsight, the Americans have realized that they have, uh, well, for one of a better phrase, dropped the ball a bit on the Middle East. Yeah, they, they took a step back, they shifted their focus to Indo-Pacific, China, you know, uh, and then this thing, this thing blows up. Um, whether it would uh, sort of compel a reconfiguration of American... Uh, engagement and deployment of resources to some degree i think i believe that it will yeah because um in fact uh, president biden has already indicated that he's going to provide uh, so he's going to provide some support uh, for for israel that's of course to deal with the the immediate conflict then after that <laughs> as we know about the the middle east it's never just the immediate immediate right yeah um, the question is now if the if the united states has to to some degree reoriented back to the Middle East, how long is it going to, you know, how much bandwidth is that going to occupy? Yeah? So uh, then it gets to the, the second uh, question, uh, the second issue about um, deployment of, of resources. I think the United, <coughs> the United States is, you know, this whole question about the, the, the fatigue of being a global power is going to really stretch it uh, now. You know, we, people, for a long time, people who, who sort of engaged in strategic studies talked about 
the US capability to fight a two-front war. I don't, I'm not sure if they talked about three. the US capability to fight a three-front war, mm. yeah? or rather you know, three, three concurrent campaigns. Yeah? Mm. So this is something that is definitely going to, be, to, to stretch uh, the, the United States. Already, we, as we saw uh, recently, the question of uh, Ukraine and support for Ukraine um, is already, uh, you know, people are already starting to um, experience fatigue on that score. Um, they have tried to, and they continue to be very resolute on Taiwan. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the reasons why the, the, the Chinese are very upset and, uh, and believe that the United States is shifting the goalposts is precisely because the United States is doing far more militarily uh, for Taiwan than, uh, than the Chinese believe that they had agreed to. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, Israel, old ally, old friend, coming back into the picture, uh, requiring uh, that, that support, um, that would complicate things uh, even further. And it's not just that. It's, uh, I think there was a, a question about um, the, uh, China's role and, uh, and uh, uh, in uh, sort of uh, orchestrating or at least facilitating the, the rapprochement between uh, Iran and, and Saudi mm. Arabia. Um, of course, a lot of groundwork was done by others for that, for that to happen. But I think the larger issue is this conflict, uh, this, this, this conflict uh, initiated by Hamas is taking place at a very critical time, right? We were looking at uh, some sort of uh, reconfiguration of dynamics uh, in the Middle East already, right? Uh, Israel, Saudi Arabia, the Abrahamic uh, Accords, we uh, don't forget the traction of that. And uh, another question then is what does that do in terms of shifting that that uh, that reconfig or reconfiguring that ongoing reconfiguration? I think uh, that is another uh, a major major issue that we need to we need to uh, keep in mind. Um, and then the question on on economics, um, I think that uh, I you know as a, as a good em uh, academic, I, I stated my case, but I qualified it. <laughs> so so I said that uh, not not without uh, some tough uh, course correction. Yeah. Mm. So my, if you ask me, my sense uh, now is that, um, yes, the, the, the Chinese economy is going through a difficult time. From the perspective, uh, the purely uh, un, uninformed guess, from the perspective of the, the Chinese leadership, i.e. Xi Jinping, this is a necessary pain as part of his larger uh, pr call it project, you know, of reforming and restructuring uh, Chinese society, right? In the sense that, um, remember, I talked about how um, he was he was very uh, uh, surgically going after. It's surgical. It's not like across the board. Surgically going after uh, entities that uh, number one do not contribute to the larger uh, mission. Number two, are probably part of that, um, that sort of uh, 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 co corrupt, for want of a better mm. word, you know, system Cabal. that had been in place you know, uh, in the past. Mm. Yeah? And uh, so from his perspective, uh, this question of uh, addressing the, the, the debt-driven driver of economic growth, uh, that was very much part of the old system, um, was something that he, he, I think he feels that he needs to rectify. And if that means that the, the economy has to go through some of this short-term pain, then so be it. The problem is how, whether the, or not the people are going to react to that short-term pain and how they are going to react. Yeah? Uh, it's well and good from the perspective of the leadership to say that we have to do this. And then when you implement it, the best example is COVID. Right and uh, the the lockdown policy, you implement it. If the the response is less than enthusiastic about the policies, what are you going to do? Yeah, and in the interest of your own uh, uh, legitimacy and credibility and that of the party, what are you going to do? So uh, tough course correct. So that therein lies the toughness in the course corrections that he has to take. 
Joseph, you're taking the questions very in depth and seriously. That's good. But I just have a physical limitation. I've got three people standing for at least 10 minutes. And I've got I think Sorry. three more questions in the box. No, no, it's okay. good. You've incited a lot of... Uh, so if you don't mind, the three of you will get to you. But let me get through the questions here in the box first. Otherwise, they feel left out. Uh, I would classify them in two ways. Some of them are asking more about Singapore, which you've talked about, but they want to come out a bit more. I think this point in particular is very uh, yet to be discussed. You suggested that Singapore politicians must uh, consider, explain, educate, consider, explain, educate, or some sort of something like that. You know, is Singapore prepared for that? For, for if we don't have to, if to manage this factor of choosing our national interests, are we prepared to uh, do that uh, in our own polity? Um, Sub-concept question of that is Singapore corporations, you mentioned the appeal of China's economy. Uh, would they uh, be uh, swayed by uh, China's economic attraction or conversely Chinese sanctions and tariffs which they've used against Korea, Philippine goods, quite a few, but so far, not too much on us. Connected to that, and a point you made, may I add one more about who is going to make those policies? You said that you're not asking for this foreign policy to be made by public opinion. That's fine. Uh, but there is a divide. Uh, Singapore elite show much more predominance towards America. Uh, that's the survey that other think tanks show. Whereas Pew survey suggests that uh, much more broadly, the commercial interests, those Singaporeans very conversant with Chinese and Chinese culture, sway a bit the other way. Could I, mm. So that's one cluster of the Singapore questions. Could I put that to you and then we'll come to the people uh, standing up. Okay, um, so, so very quickly, um, in terms of, in terms of um, who, who makes the, the or let me take the last question because I think that's the most important one. This uh, divide that uh, it appears that the, the leadership is sort of more towards the US and the people are more towards uh, 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 China. Um, first is, I mean, these, these, are, these are surveys and um, I think they are a useful reference point, but we shouldn't sort of uh, take, it, take them as the, 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 the final statement on, on sentiment. The second is, um, I, so one of the, my own personal frustrations is, uh, you know, I mentioned that we should not, we should really try not to think in binary terms, yeah. And um, in that sense, you know, mm. the, the, the question is casting it in a binary, binary, in a binary yes. way, right? Um, uh, to me, the, the issue is whether you choose, okay, if you want to talk about choice, the question is whether you choose to work with China or the United States from the vantage of wanting to align yourself or to endear yourself, you know, or for an alliance obligation, whatever, to the United States or China, or you are choosing a position on a particular issue because you feel that it's for Singapore's good, and that issue uh, ends up aligning you with mm. yes. you know, the American view or the Chinese view on that issue. To me, those are two very separate issues, two, two, very, separate, two very separate things. Mm. So, I think, so this is why um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not too big a fan of, of you know, trying to, to, to see um, what Singapore chose or uh, you know, yeah, what Singapore chose in relation to uh, this power or that. But the question is why did, did Singapore uh, do that? And explain so, it to our own audience as well yes. as to the two powers and yeah. other friends. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have yeah. 10 minutes left and I'm going to go the man in grey, the other man in the blazer and then the man right at the back. Please, go ahead. Hi, Hi Prof Liao. Um, this is Bang from Bloomberg News. Um, two very simple questions. Um, expectations are raising about the potential Xi Jinping by the meeting at APEC. Sorry, I can't quite hear you. Can you speak up a bit? APEC meeting. Yeah, it's about the APEC meeting. Yes. So expectations are raising that um, President Xi Jinping might meet um, with Biden in San Francisco. So I'm just wondering like, if such a summit really takes place, what would we expect mm -hmm. of such a meeting? 
And my second question is about the Belt and Road Initiative. So this year marks the 10th anniversary of the program. But in the last three years, we've seen a significant slowdown due to COVID and geopolitical tensions. I'm just wondering what do you make of the BRI from here on? Do you think that the slowdown was more temporary or do you think that it will go on? Thank you. Would you mind if you take the off three yeah, questions? Yeah, sure. Please. Uh, thank you, Prof. Simon, and thanks for your thought-provoking lecture, Prof. Joseph. So I'm a student, a graduate student from uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. My name is Kai Zhe. So my question is also about economic competition between U.S. and China. As we already mentioned that the BRI is already uh, uh, have a 10 years anniversary of its own. And nearly 80% of uh, UN member states have already joined this initiative. And in response, in response to that, US is actually initiating a uh, free and open Indo-Pacific uh, strategy or we call it initiative to encounter this BRI. So will this become a new round of pick a sad game for the states that want to integrate into the world economy in the future. Thank you. In particular, you mean the new statement that they will help build infrastructure between India through the Middle East into Europe? Exactly. Yes. And the, the last gentleman, please. Um, thank you for the le lecture. My name is Fan Sun Sung. I'm a research officer from the ICS Yushu Bishop Institute. So last year when President Xi Jinping met with President Biden at the sideline of the G20 summit, there was expectation that the two countries would talk more. They would compromise, uh, especially after the tension caused by Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. And then the balloon incident happened, and that set back the progress. And now, once again, we are seeing the resumption of dip diplomatic communication, um, and again, expectation that the two countries will again talk to each other. But what if another balloon incident happens? What if there's another contingency? It feels like the two countries are locked in this situation where you have one step forward and one step back. So how do we okay. ensure that that will not happen again? How do we ensure that progress will be steady moving forward? Well, if just one step forward and one step back is not too bad. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're kind of glad we took the three together. They kind of yeah, circle yeah. around. Yeah. Joseph, we should go okay. ahead. Uh, yeah. Maybe I start with the, the, yeah. the last question. I mean, uh, whether it will happen again, uh, I don't know. But, uh, you know, it probably will. Right. I some mean, point, such, yeah. such is yeah. At some point, something is going to happen. At some point, and this is why, um, to the the, mm. the point, uh, Zipang about uh, uh, APEC and the, mm. the leaders meeting. If they if they meet, I hope they do. Um, it is very important that the leaders express uh, commitment to continue uh, the dialogue, continue working together, even if these sorts of things uh, happen. Yeah, mm. I think um, we. It has to be assumed that that uh, that it will happen. It has to be factored yeah. into into the calculation. Uh, if I may add, I Joseph, I mean yeah. your paradigm about leadership, individual leadership mattering. Yeah. Uh, that's the critical juncture of these face-to-face -face meetings. Yes. And yeah. remember that these two guys were vice presidents together. Yeah. If you play back some of the things that Joe Biden used to say in China, 10, 15 years ago, at a different time, mm. it was just so positive. Yeah. Let's hope the character prior knowledge the other can help. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, and I will add to that, my, my own view is that uh, I think the, the, the Americans may not quite uh, understand uh, mm. Xi Jinping. Yeah. You know, I think a, a lot of them compare him to Mao. I think he's very different from, from, from Mao. But mm. uh, uh, I do hear, I mean, not all uh, American uh, uh, thinkers do that, but mm. quite a number of them do. And mm. I think that... Uh, that betrays a misunderstanding mm. of, of, of the man and what he's, what he's trying yes. to do, what he's trying to achieve. Um, and then there was a question on the, yeah, the BRI, mm. right? Um, on on the BRI, I think, uh, the, to put it simply, I think the, the, the Chinese uh, realized that they bit off more than they can chew. Yeah, it was way too ambitious. And the reason why it was so ambitious uh, was because it was a very ambiguous uh, uh, entity, right? And I mean, anything and everything could come under the BRI, yeah. Uh, and in a sense, sometimes it's it's in the nature mm. of um, of uh, sort of uh, uh, Chinese uh, well, edicts or directives, Everyone right? Runs. It's, yeah, it's it, yeah. it's very big, it's very all-encompassing, 
and it's open to the, the interpretation uh, uh, down the line. So, you know, you have uh, all sorts of... Uh, uh, because if you, if you can sort of position it as a BRI project in the, in, the, in, the, in the good days, right? If you could position it as a BRI project, you could get all sorts of support uh, for it at the regional, local mm -hmm. level. So, so a lot of people did that. Um, and I think the, the, the Chinese also uh, ended up uh, uh, in uh, getting... Uh, 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 into situations with loans, with investments in uh, projects that uh, mm. really, uh, you know, did not make uh, commercial sense. So this is the difference, I think, uh, uh, last point, this is the difference between um, how uh, the Chinese had approached uh, this to um, the, the sort of uh, the Japanese, the, the Americans. Uh, I mean, in the case of the, the, the US, until Biden tried to force through some sort of uh, industrial policy, in the case of the US, it was uh, you know, always uh, private sector uh, firms, uh, free enterprise. If you're not going to make money, you know, I don't really care about your larger strategic uh, uh, imperatives. You know, I got shareholders to be accountable for. Um, the Chinese were very different, right? Uh, the Chinese state-owned enterprises know that it is uh, their KPI is to make sure that they have projects that can be labelled uh, as BRI. Yeah? Um, whether or not it makes money or not, we'll, we'll deal with that later. Right? But as it turns out, now they have to deal with it. Yeah? And so it's, it's become a challenge, it's become a drain on, on resource, not at a very good time for, for China, because the economy uh, is not uh, doing great. Um, so when the, the next uh, round of the BRI is going to be rolled out um, as, as it as it is, it's going to be smaller. Uh, small is beautiful, right? Um, and the, the reason why is because uh, you, the, the leadership probably wants to be careful not to convey the impression mm. that you are still going to be funding these huge projects while your people are, are struggling uh, to make ends meet. So you see a reset and perhaps a scaling down, focusing, yeah, and more discipline. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've cool. been asked to wrap up. Four minutes left. Uh, I want to do so by putting a possibly a big question to Joseph in a very short time. Uh, it picks up what you have just said, resetting, focusing. What does it take for China to convince the world that it's pursuing a peaceful rise? Is it possible to go back to the old paradigm? I think uh, China has to, re or this current Chinese leadership, uh, it would be good if they, re they realized uh, where the pain points for others are when they're dealing uh, with, with China. Um, especially in the case, so take, take for example, there was a question on the uh, South China Sea from uh, Big earlier, right? So the US and China, you boil it down, the Chinese have a territorial dispute it, uh, with Southeast Asian countries, right? which means that no matter how good your relations are on other scores, you still have this territorial conflict, uh, or, uh, you know, this territorial dispute that cannot be wished away. So how are you going to manage mm. this dispute, right? And you are dealing with Southeast Asian countries. Philippines, yes, it's an ally of the, of the United States. The uh, uh, Malaysia, uh, uh, Brunei, who's, which is always very quiet on this. Um, uh, Vietnam, which is uh, you know, a major regional power. But the reality is China is basically huge, right? And it casts this long uh, shadow. And this is why I also mentioned it in my lecture. You know, the, the tricky part is great powers. They think, like, they think mm. and act like great powers, you know? And, that's what they do. That's what great powers do. You know? um, so for them, ideally, if they can really invest more effort to, mm. to think about the impact of what they are doing, um, I think is, is, to me, is quite an important uh, facet of it. But, but whether or not they, they will do that, I... Well, thank you, Joseph. I think yeah. that um, one of you have said uh, that China will hear voices. Um, secondly, in your own talk, Joseph, you mentioned how Singapore as a whole will need to speak up as a small state uh, and has certain resources. But I think both in the survey and the very serious and detailed uh, way you took the questions, uh, you would be one of those voices uh, to be heard, hopefully, from our small island. 
to talk about these huge issues that concern us not just now and the short term you've covered, but longer into the future. Please join me in thanking Joseph Liao. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Liao and Professor Tay. Thank you for a very interesting question and answer session. We have come to the end of today's lecture. We would like to hear your views on the event. Please click our link on the, the Facebook feed or scan the QR code on the screen to submit your feedback. Professor Liao's second lecture titled Southeast Asia in a Shifting Global Order, Grasping the Nettle or Groping the Duck will take place on 1st November. Details will be on our website and IPS Facebook page. We hope to see you then. Thank you and have a good evening ahead. <laughs>